Hello all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another animal story. Followers of the channel know I love animals as much as I love history, so today I'll look at some of the most interesting birds that call Florida home. These are birds that are pretty common to see throughout the state, ones that naturally could be part of the average visitor's experience. For example, I've seen and photographed them in major theme parks, in zoos, mostly as visitors themselves, as well as on airboat tours, in botanical gardens, the Everglades, and around local lake shores. I'll be discussing six different species which can be grouped into two families. The first group is part of the rail family, the American Coot, American Purple Gallinule, and the Common Gallinule. The second group are members of the Ibis family, the Glossy, White, and Scarlet Ibis. I think it'll be interesting to look at these two groups together. They have some similarities, such as size, but also notable differences. All of them are very watchable birds with interesting habits. Hopefully, if you haven't spent any time viewing them, this video will give you insights into their lives and their habits. And if you're a visitor to the Sunshine State, maybe you'll notice them as you queue for a roller coaster, look at the more exotic animals in one of the state's excellent zoos, or drive along the shore of one of Florida's 30,000 lakes. Two quick notes about the birds I've chosen, especially for those of you who already know about them. Firstly, the Scarlet Ibis isn't actually a Florida native. It's from Northern South America. I've included it here because it's a resident of several of our zoos. Plus, there's disagreement into whether the scarlet is a distinct species or a subspecies of the white ibis. Secondly, the bird I'm calling the common gallinule is more commonly called the common moorhen, but, like the scarlet, its species designation is in dispute. I'll cover both of these issues in a bit. So let's start with the American coot. While it's one of 10 coots in the world, it's the only one that's native to the continental U.S. Because of its singular status, it's generally known in Florida as simply coot. But then there's the less formal use of the name, generally reserved for describing an older, amusing, or odd man. Florida has plenty of those, too. The coot's scientific name or binomial nomenclature, shown here, simply means American coot. In Latin, fulica means coot. The coot is a medium water bird weighing less than one and a half pounds or 680 grams. As an adult, it's basically black or dark gray with a bit of white on its rear. Like the two other rails I'm covering, its most defining feature is the bill and shield located above the bill. The bill is white, while there's a red-brown mark set between the eyes. Their eyes are bright red, and the legs and feet are yellow-green. The feet aren't webbed like a duck's, but instead have broad lobed scales, which both allow for effective paddling as well as walking on water plants. The coot, along with each of the other birds in this video, have something called a nictitating membrane in their eyes. This is a transparent or translucent third eyelid which is drawn across the eye horizontally to protect and moisten it while maintaining vision. It's believed that birds who have these eyelids can actively control them, which is different from some other animals. I'll show some of the other eyelids later. By the way, humans and some other mammals have a small vestigial portion of the nictitating membrane remaining in the corner of their eyes. Coots are light enough to walk on the top of water plants, which allows them to navigate weed-choked lakes. Generally considered freshwater birds, they are found in and around lakes, marshes, and streams. Their stubby bills are designed for feeding on algae and water plants, both when they dive and on the surface. 
Being omnivorous, they also feed on small fish, mollusks, and other invertebrates. They will actually eat more fish and arthropods during the breeding season for the higher protein and fat content, which is beneficial for egg production and the health of their chicks. Like many smaller birds, they're commonly found floating around in flocks, which helps in their safety. They are able to fly, though like many rails, they're not the best flyers. Considering the habitat of lakes, marshes, and streams, it's not surprising that they're a common sight in Florida. They can be spotted year-round in the entire state. Of course, you'll have to look for them. Not only are they fairly small, they spend much of their time in the safety of water plants. One way to find them is their call, which sounds like this. So let's look next at the common gallinule. Like the coot, it's nearly entirely black or dark gray with a faint bluish tint. It also has white tail feathers and yellow legs, but its bill and shield are bright red with a yellow tip. This immediately identifies them versus the coot, even at a distance. They're a bit smaller, weighing only up to a pound or about 450 grams, and have dark red eyes. Going back to the subject of the name, I'm using the term common gallinule, which distinguishes it from the common moorhen name. I grew up calling them moorhens, which certainly is descriptive of the bird. The thing is, is that there are two similar species that are divided by location, Old World and New World. The American Ornithological Society determined that the two should be split in 2011, though not everyone agrees. By the way, the term gallinule is from the Latin term little hen, so in the grand scheme of things, I suppose it doesn't really matter. Its scientific name means helmeted chicken. Like the coot with which they're closely related, the gallinule eats both plants and animals. This includes water plants, insects, small rodents, and even eggs. The bird's feet are similar to the coot, albeit lacking the lobe scales. The broad feet still allow the gallinule to walk on the lily pads and other water plants. In fact, the gallinule primarily either walks or paddles through open water, even though it has the ability to fly. It's not the strongest of flyers, and appears mostly to do so in order to quickly escape a perceived threat. Both gallinules and coots nest on the ground in basket-like nests. As can be seen here, Chicks quickly leave the nest to accompany their parents while foraging. They have black feathers with a developing red bill and shield. Chicks mature into juveniles in a few weeks and fledge within 40 to 50 days. They begin with a light gray chest, darker gray head and neck, and a brown back, which darkens over a few weeks until adopting adult plumage. Even as juveniles, they stay close to their parents. In contrast to the coot, the common gallinule appears to either be more numerous in Florida or it spends more time out from undercover. I've seen them more often than coots, although both are very common. Its range includes the entire state. Here's the call of the common gallinule. The third bird on the list is not surprisingly quite similar to both the coot and the gallinule. Known as the American purple gallinule, on cloudy days it's quite possible to mistake it for a common gallinule. Its body is generally dark and it has a red bill with a yellow tip. There's a significant difference, however, in the shield part of the bill, the part between the eyes, is pale blue. Plus, while the body plumage is generally dark, on a bright day it's clear that it's actually beautifully multi-hued iridescent colors, blue-purple with green and turquoise. With the white tail feathers and red eyes like the other birds, as well as yellow legs, it's quite possibly the most colorful bird native to Florida. Its scientific name means purple of Martinique, referencing the small Caribbean island. 
The purple gallinule is the lightest of all the three birds, weighing about 10 ounces or only 280 grams. While it's smaller, the difference isn't immediately apparent, even when viewing them swimming and walking in the vicinity of the other birds. They're omnivores and can walk on water plants as well as paddle in open water. They can also fly somewhat limited distances. Unlike the other two, they build their nests on dense vegetation on the water instead of on land. Chicks are black and brown, while juveniles have light brown chests and darker brown and bronze backs and necks. Juveniles mature into adult plumage gradually, and you can spot individuals which have a mixture of dull brown and iridescent plumage. Here's the call of the purple gallinule. You might notice that these three are hardly songbirds. More than 5,000 years ago, a kingdom developed along the Nile River. This Egyptian dynasty worshipped many gods, including one named Thoth. For Egyptians, Thoth was the god of the moon, wisdom, writing, hieroglyphics, science, magic, art, and judgment. He was typically depicted in his human form with the head of an ibis. This would have been the species known as the African sacred ibis, which is, rather obviously, native to Africa. The ibis was a sacred animal, so sacred that Egyptians mummified and entombed some eight million birds as religious offerings over thousands of years. The white ibis, which is native to Florida, is also a medium-sized bird, Weighing up to 2 pounds or 900 grams is just a little heavier than the coot, though because of its long legs and long curved bill, it appears quite a bit larger. While ibis are often found near and in water, they're considered to be semi-aquatic, meaning that they're also commonly found foraging in grasslands. It's generally white with a red-orange bill and legs and black feathers on its wingtips. Its long legs denote it's a wading bird while foraging along the shore of rivers, marshes, lakes, and saltwater estuaries. Here you can see them in a bald cypress swamp in Highlands Hammock State Park. Unlike the previous birds, it doesn't paddle while floating, instead it either walks or flies. It's an excellent flyer, much like its nearest relative, the roseate spoonbill. It's found throughout Florida and is one of the most visible birds in the state considering its color, its population numbers, and the fact that it can be seen foraging in the yards of suburban homes along with the site of highways and even places such as theme parks. If you look closely at the bill, you'll see that birds which forage on land do so by prodding their bill into the vegetation and soil. Ibis used this prodding motion of the bill as the primary way to find food when searching in water, but used a combination of eyesight and prodding on land. Their diet consists of crayfish, insects, grubs, fish, lizards, and frogs. Like coots and gallinule, white ibis are social birds and are more often found in groups than alone. They forage in the vicinity of other birds, including herons, egrets, spoonbills, and flamingos, and they nest in trees, often directly above the water. Chicks are dark brown overall and have yet to develop their long bill. While juveniles are medium brown on the body and light brown on the head and neck, it's common to see juveniles that appear piebald as their adult plumage comes in. The bird's scientific name means glorious or famous white. Here's the call of the white ibis. The scarlet ibis isn't a Florida native, but it can be found in the collections of several of Florida's zoos, including Zoo Tampa, Bush Gardens, and the Brevard Zoo. Note that all of the scarlet ibis photos I'm showing are individuals in captivity, 
while all the other photos of the birds are of wild ones, even those photographed in zoos or gardens. The Scarlet's range is mostly the northern coast of South America and nearby islands, and the white ibis shares parts of its habitat. While the two are often considered separate species, there are credible arguments to show the scarlet is a variation of the white. Its scientific name means glorious or famous red, and its size and description are identical to the white, with the exception of the bright orange-red color. It has red legs and bill, as well as black feathers at the tips of its wings. They have a similar diet of insects, grubs, crayfish, and frogs. They also eat a significant amount of shrimp. The bird gets its scarlet color from these shrimp and other crustaceans. The red color is a carotenoid, an organic pigment that's produced by some plants, algae, fungus, and bacteria. Carotenoids are what color pumpkins, carrots, corn, and tomatoes. While scarlets get the pigment from the shrimp, the shrimp get it from feeding on blue-green algae and other plant plankton. The algae and plankton use carotenoid as one method to absorb energy from sunlight. While further study is needed, there's a hypothesis that the scarlet color might be due to the presence of an enzyme that allows uptake of the carotenoid pigment in the diet. White ibis may lack the enzyme while scarlets have it. This would explain why whites, which share the same habitat and have similar diets, lack the scarlet color. Here's the call of the scarlet ibis. Our final bird is the glossy ibis. Once again, other than coloration, there's little apparent difference between these three ibis. On average, the glossy is a bit smaller, weighing about one and a half pounds or 680 grams. Much like the purple gallinule, on darker cloudy days, the glossy appears to be dark brown or nearly black, but in sunlight, its wings have a dark iridescent green and purple glossy appearance. The rest of its plumage is dark red-brown, as are the legs and bill. The glossy is common throughout Florida, however it doesn't appear to regularly forage in urban and suburban environments like the white. It's common in the state's wetlands, lakes, estuaries, and similar habitats. The glossy is also the most widespread ibis, and is found on every continent except Antarctica. That being said, it's a recent immigrant to the Americas. The first sightings of the bird in North America occurred in the early 19th century, and John James Audubon noted only one sighting in his travels in Florida in 1832. It's believed that the species naturally migrated from Central Africa to South America and spread north to Florida. It's not the only Florida bird to have arrived along that route. The cattle egret also crossed the Atlantic from Africa to South America and became established on both American continents. Its first sightings in Florida were as recently as the 1940s. The diet of the glossy ibis includes amphibians, insects, lizards, crayfish, shrimp, fish, and mollusks. It forages in the same way as the other two ibis, hunting both in shallow water and on land. It's social and is commonly found in flocks of its own species as well as among white ibis and other birds like egrets, herons, and spoonbills. Its scientific name derives from ancient Greek and Latin terms that both mean sickle, which refers to its distinctive bill. It's not the only animal with a redundant scientific name. The brown bear is Ursus arctos, which means bear, bear, in Latin and Greek. Here's the call of the scarlet ibis. This video doesn't really need much of a summation. 
This channel covers the history of tourism in the state, and I suppose this might not fit the bill, excuse the pun, but of the many millions of visitors that make their way to the Sunshine State every year, many tens of thousands of them will see one or more of these birds. I've always been impressed at how much our wildlife makes itself visible to the average person. I've seen hawks hunt squirrels in an urban park. A dozen different species of birds simultaneously raising their young next to boardwalks in an alligator farm. And deer placidly grazing inside Disney's Magic Kingdom. Visitors can see a massive bald eagle's nest while taking the Kennedy Space Center bus tour. Silvery mullet constantly jumping in any number of brackish coastal streams. And while they're not exactly wild, view cattle on ranches from expensive resort balconies. It's almost like Florida's nature is finding ways to make itself known to tourists. Thank you once again for watching another of my videos. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more information about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.